Many years ago, uh, there was a great film that came out, Expelled No Intelligence Allowed with Ben, um, and uh, it had over, was shown in over 1,100 theaters. It actually was the 18th greatest earnings of all documents and hi documentaries in history. Um, and it, it went, it did a look at how different people uh, were considering the creation model and uh, certainly the problems with evolution were being discussed. And there's a little clip in there that comes out <laughs> in the internet where Richard Dawkins ends up turning to aliens to feed life on Earth as opposed to God. That was very interesting. Richard Dawkins is a well-known atheist from Oxford University who's written many books and is quite anti-Christian. Now, what's God's view? We have, you have these worldviews, so let's look at how God view. God's view, we see in Job 12, 7, 9, where it says, And now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. So you just went into all the domains of nature, right? Who among all these things does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? So, and, and I want to add something to that. In Revelation when we have this great vision of the Apostle John, and he sees God on the throne, and he sees these weird creatures, and he sees these angels, and they're all worshiping God, and then he has these 24 elders with crowns. You're all sort of familiar with that scenario? It was pretty big. And then they, they take their crowns, they throw it at the ground, and then they, the elders, worship God. And what did it say? You are worthy of all glory, honor, power, for, because of what? You created all things. That's amazing. The, the fact that God is creator, and once we recognize it, will bring us to our knees in recognition of who he is. That's why Satan hates the creation message and certainly doesn't want it to be said in our schools. Oh, I'm turning it on here and not here. All right. You see, God's creation, uh, we're actually pre-programmed to recognize God as creator. And that's a problem because whether you're a believer or not, you're pre-programmed to recognize the hand of a creator. If we have a, a river with some pebbles in it and there's an Indian arrowhead, no one has to take a university course, despite that's the exact same rock as the pebbles, to know that Indian arrowhead is the result of intelligence. Right. You don't have to have any training whatsoever. Is there. Because God wants us to discover him and see his signature in creation. And it's frustrating a bit for the evolutionists because even they say, everything looks like it's being designed with a purpose. Maybe it looks that way because it was. Uh, I don't want to push thing, things, but anyway. Okay, so Charles Darwin, he recognizes that the eye is a bit of an issue here. How do you get the eye from, with natural selection? And so he says this, and I'm quoting from uh, Origin of Species, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amount of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. He says, the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection, through insuperable, uh, though insuperable by our imagination, in other words, not possible to imagine, should not be considered subversive to the th of the theory. Well, why not? I think it should be. So, I was once, uh, not too many years ago, I was giving a, uh, I was supposed to do a debate at Ramuski. I've done 20 debates. This one didn't work out because 24 hours before I arrived, the teacher ghosted. <laughs> and didn't come. But, tw but, uh, but everything was set up. And it wasn't at the university, it was actually in a local, lo local tavern, which is a great place to do a debate. People are much more relaxed than at university. <laughs> 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 really, <laughs> it's great. Uh, and you get a lot more dog Christians. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we were in this, so they, everything was set up. So I came up, gave my talk anyway. I had no way to debate, but three teachers did show up, sat around a table, they weren't so relaxed. And when I got to, uh, the question and answer, one got up, started giving his own talk, and he accused me of having misquoted Darwin about this, because he said Darwin spent the time explaining it. So that night, till three in the morning, I read the 85 pages of Darwin's explanations about the eye that follow this. He didn't explain anything. But the key, what he did say, the key was this, next slide. And it comes just before, uh, there we go. Just before, 
he's mentioned the problem with the eye. He says this, how a nerve comes to be sensitive to light hardly concerns us more than how life itself first originated. <laughs> Wait a second, that's the whole question. <laughs> Where did it come from? And this is, evolutionists like to take something that's small and make it big to transform it. And we all, creationists, evolutionists, all agree in adaptation, though we have a different versions. Um, we have different types of frogs. We have different types of princes. We just don't believe the frogs can become princes, uh, even, if you, even if you give them 150 million years. So here he says, even if we, have a, just, we just need a nerve, it, it doesn't matter to us. Oh, no, it matters to us. And it should matter to us because that's why he can't make the eye work. It's not a question of climbing Mount Impossible. It's you've just hit an impossible cliff. There's no, if, the, if the organism is already living without eyes, it's already surviving, it's already doing fine, why would it have to have eyes, which are much more complex, cost a lot of energy, and are a lot of problem once you have them and lose them? It doesn't make any sense. And, and that's where he made his big mistake. Where did life come from? Now, he didn't have all the tools we have, you understand, 1859 and before. We're not talking genetics. We're talking much cells like a box. It doesn't have all the stuff we know, uh, which makes us, at this stage, much more responsible for our conclusions about the origin of life. Because I think, I'm suspicious that Darwin would actually not, maybe not hold to his theory had he known what we know now. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an example, just, a, just really, rec I'm, I'm not going to go into this detail, but just to give you a bit of the complexity around the eye, this is just for that famous nerve he's talking about, because the eye is much more than a nerve, as you can imagine. Um, it takes this microbial, it takes this rhodopsin that absorbs fo uh, photons of light, and that's, that's bl the black and white uh, light. So we're not talking about color, just black and white. And you can, it's, it starts getting a little bit complicated right off the bat. And you know, the funny thing is, this is a trilobite. This is a trilobite that for evolutionists, this is a real, these are, my fossils are real fossils. This trilobite um, for an evolutionist would, ha would be some 600 million years old. And it would be the beginning of life. We get them here in BC. It's called the Cambrian explosion. The problem is they have eyes. They have eyes that are serrated like those of a fly. They correct for, we think anyway, they correct for the uh, bending of light in water, their water, the crustaceans. Um, they have a brain that must deal with all that data. There's no pre-trilobite. So in one of my debates with Dr. Cyril Barrett at University of Laval, the head of the Department of Biology, I, I debated him four times actually, uh, I, I brought this with me. And while going through my, I think the rebuttal, I, I put this in front of him, I said, Dr. Barrett, what makes this primitive? He said, I'm not a specialist in trilobites. <laughs> Too obvious. All right, so as you can see, it gets complicated, and, uh, and actually it starts, and I'm not going to, because we don't have time, I'm not going to go into all of this, obviously. But just to say, it's a really complex process, and it, it, there are certain uh, pro, um, chemical uh, shunts that are needed or, or protein shunts that are needed and specific chemicals that are needed so that we can possibly see anything even in black and white. This simple nerve is not simple is what I'm getting at. Darwin couldn't know this but that's what it is. Now the question is can we make it evolve? In other words can it come from something simpler? Well we got we got to take a look at the genes. So the genes that coded for this since we're supposed to come from a bacteria there are bacteria that have rhodopsin Let's take a look at their genes. And if I go to Wikipedia, which is, of course, the source of all truth, <laughs> uh, Rhodopsin evolution from bacteria to human eyes. That's part of the article in, that, in Wikipedia. While all microbial Rhodopsins have significant sequence homology, that means that they look similar to one another, they have no detectable sequence in homology to the G, pro specifically the G protein coupled receptor, which is a super important section to which the animal visual rhodopsins belong. In other words, evolution would have to evolve this system twice by chance in two different lines because the genes that code for the exact same thing in bacteria, it's another set of genes that code for the exact same thing in us. Doesn't sound like evolution could do that. And of course you have, we start looking at things like metamorphosis where you have a double, uh, uh, a double organism. You have a, a caterpillar, the, the DNA that codes for a caterpillar, which is a, basically a stomach that eats, then it codes for the cocoon, then it codes for the 
destruction of the stomach, of the caterpillar, and then it becomes a butterfly that does continental migrations based on the magnetic, um, the electromagnetic uh, force around the Earth. How do you do that without a creator? My question is always how. I'm never on the defensive about creation. I've given over 1,000 talks. It's over 30 years I've been talking on this, and it's just a hobby. Um, but I'm not on the defensive. Why would I be? They want to believe something. Our only responsibility is to say how. They have to explain it. Before I start undoing something that's wrong, they should tell me how it worked in the first place. So if they want, oh, we descend from monkeys. All right, do you know what the differences are between monkeys or the ancestors of monkeys to humans? No, they don't. So I help them. And then I start telling them they, got, they, get, they don't have feet, they have hands. You've got to change that. You've got to change the knee. You've got to change the hip, the inner ear, the backbone. You're going to change all of that in two million years? How many, how many DNA code do you need to do that? They've never thought of it. How? It's not my theory. It doesn't make sense to me. My theory is llamas create llamas, cows create cows, monkeys create monkeys, and humans create humans. And I can show that any day of the week in any lab. And I can repeat it over and over again. That's science. If you believe princes can be, uh, frogs can become princes in 150 million years, that's your belief. But it's not something I can show, except in books and fairy tales. Uh, so metamorphosis, th the problem with that genetically is why would you ever have that extra load? You understand the code, the caterpillar doesn't even reproduce. How would evolution even do anything with that? This is an example of what I call, and I'll be talking about the church tomorrow, overdesign. Overdesign is a very powerful argument for a creator. Evolution would never overdesign. It's not even able to get what we needed to get. But to do overkill, it's all over nature, it's overkill. I call it audacious creation. It's overkill everywhere, whether it's a woodpecker, whether it's phasmids, metamorphic you know, butterflies, what are they really? You say, oh, they're beautiful. No, no, butterflies in the system of nature are food. Butterflies and moths are just food. That's what they are for other organisms. Okay, there's surely a lot easier way of getting protein than doing something as complex as a butterfly. But that's because we serve a God. That's a great God. <laughs> and there's symbiosis, insects and plants, you can't get the one without the other. So, let's go to the first one. Writings in the chapters of Genesis are fables. All righty. Well, Jesus confirms the writings from the <laughs> book of Genesis, of course, because he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. You know what? Why don't we say that? I just want to hear those three words. I don't know why. Let's do this. Male and female. Oh, that feels so good. <laughs> wow. I don't know why, but God repeats it. He made them male and female. Uh, Mark 10, 7, says, and of course, where does he put male and <laughs> Adam and Eve? At the beginning. So whether you like it or not, forget the Big Bang, because Adam and Eve aren't sitting out there in space. They're on Earth, and it's already flourishing, and they're there at the beginning, and unless, I don't care what you do with Genesis when you want to make it a poem, I'm sure you're not making a poem out of what Jesus just said about marriage and divorce. Right. So here we're talking about a real humans being there at the beginning, and it's not the scenario of, uh, that we're being necessarily being proposed for origins it in our universities. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. All right. And now we look at Jesus. What does he say also about Luke? He says that he talks about Noah. So he believes in a literal Noah. So he believes in a literal creation, a six-day creation, a literal Noah. In the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, they did eat, drink, married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. The genealogy of Jesus goes back to Adam. So Adam must be a historical person. Otherwise, the genealogies don't make sense. You know, you, you don't... It's not like Jesus... If you had a king that his, his genealogy went back to, I don't know, Arthur, King Arthur, an imaginary king in the mythology or something. You understand what I mean? It, it'd be mythological, but this isn't mythological. There, he's saying, this is really a son of Noah, and then we keep going back, we'll get to Adam. All right, so he's saying very literally. So is Genesis metamorph metamorphical? 
Metaphorical, wow. <laughs> I'm getting a little tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> Metaphorical. The formulation of words is a, narr as, is a narrative. In other words, the story of Genesis is just telling it like it is. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't have some beauty to it. it doesn't mean you can, a poem can be, it's not a poem, but it, it doesn't mean it doesn't also have some literary interest. But the point of the story is, to, the point of the chapter is say, this is what happened day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Uh, it's not a parable, because parables aren't told that way. And uh, the, where there are metaphorical texts in scripture, they're, they're well identified. So it's not a fable. You understand? It's not like a, 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 a cartoon story. It's not meant to be just an example. It's, it's meant to be a literal construction of what happened according to the creator at the beginning of creation. Now, I'm not that, whether you accept it or not, we have to go contextually how does that, how should we be understanding Genesis? Well, we should be understanding it exactly the way it's written. And of course, the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus 20, 11 weren't even written by Moses. They were written by God he, with his own hand. And he says, of course, in six days, God created everything. The sky, sun, moon, everything, at all, all domains. Uh, normally, we don't make the Ten Commandments into a, a poem or a metaphor. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. It's not too metaphorical. Um, and neither are the six days. And I go on all about it. I'm not going to. Okay, so the other question we get, they think, they think we got them now, is where did Cain's wife come from? Anybody heard that before? Yeah, some people, okay, I've heard that. Oh, you, how could you have... In fact, <laughs> I had worse than that because people, not everybody on the internet is smart. <laughs> and I saw this meme the other day by this group that are Christian that believe in natural selection as the way of getting life here. And <laughs> he put up, Adam and Eve had three sons. Think about it. Well, okay, let's think about it a bit. First of all, he did have three sons that were mentioned in Genesis 4. Cain is the first son of Adam and Eve, Genesis 4.1. But Adam and Eve had many other children in Genesis 5.4. So apparently the person who did the meme didn't took more time to make the meme than he took to read the Bible. Adam and Eve made many other children, and the days of Adam after he begot Seth were 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Uh, tradition, Jewish tradition is 24. Um, could be more, could, we don't have no idea, but he had several. Now, is it a problem for Cain to marry his sister? No, because what the, the issue right now with uh, marrying uh, uh, too close is that there is human DNA degeneration going on, which means we have mutations. I have a bad news for our children. They have 60, more, 60 to 100 more mutations than we do as parents. So every parent here, you'll, just so you'll know, you're, you're actually more perfect than your kids. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. I just lost every teenager just walked out of the room. Uh, so anyway. It's revenge. Um, I'm a grandfather. Uh, grandfather's like revenge. You get the kids when they're great, and when they're not, you give them back. Um, as time moves forward, yet more and more genetic mutations, which is an issue for evolution on its own. So a study in 2001 claims that parents may transmit at least 60 mutations to their immediate descendants that they didn't have before. So there's a degenerative effect, but that effect only really comes into, a, into play after the flood. So everybody up to the flood lives about 900 years old because their genes are basically perfect. So if, there, if, you're, if you get genes that aren't perfect, so you have recessive genes, you have uh, mutations, and you have people that are too close together, obviously we're going to match up those recessive genes and we're going to get expressions of the genes that aren't expressing if we've mixed, you know, if, we, if we're further apart. Uh, he also, keep in mind, they did, um, they had many children, and Cain actually goes into other cities. If you remember when he killed Abel, there were already other cities, Right? There are people in them. Th they're all his family, but they're cousins, nephews. It doesn't have to be a close or a sister. 24 kids, he may not even know who the 23rd was. Right? I mean, that's a lot of <laughs> kids. <laughs> and so uh, there's lots of options here, but genetically, it's not a problem. Okay? And it's, by the way, the same problem for evolutionists. Okay? And the law associated with not marrying, of course, in the Bible is 1,500 years later, well after the flood, and there's a good reason for that. But keep in mind, that particular issue is an issue for evolutionists also. Okay, 
Three, why do all scientists believe evolution? Yes, so if you type my name in YouTube, Lawrence Tisdall, and afterwards put debate, you'll see a debate I did in 2007 with, on the Michael Corrin show with Dr. Jason Wiles. And Dr. Jason Wiles, I don't know if he was a doctor at that point because he was doing his doctorate. He is now, but uh, he may not have finished his doctorate at that point. But anyway, he was doing his doctorate on the teaching of evolution. And in the process of, and, and I knew this question was going to come up. It always does. So I actually brought the curriculums of many, many, many creation scientists that were doctorates. Like it was a pack this big, <laughs> literally, because just Jerry Bergman had 300 published articles. So I, I had all these, right? Because I was ready. He didn't know that. I had them beside myself. So when he brought up this, I said, that's not true, Jason. Here are some curriculums of all these doctorates that are creationists and believers. Of course, he said, oh, then he backed down, right? He said, oh, well, yeah, some, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so you have to be ready ahead of time. Now, is it true? Well, of course, it's not true. The founders of almost every single modern branch of science were believers. Not all of them Christian, some of them were theists, but you have Galileo, father of modern physics, Kepler, defined astronomical laws, Isaac Newton, about two-thirds of his writings were theological. Uh, universal gravity, of course, and many other things. Louis Pasteur, Pasteur, a uh, microbiology pioneer, and Robert Boyle, who was a strong Christian, founder of modern chemistry. There's, other, there's many others. We could go on and on. I have a list of like over 100. All these people were believers. Obviously, it's not a problem. Now, is it true that most um, evolutionists, uh, most scientists are evolutionists today? Yes, because you can't get a job otherwise, because it's the paradigm that you're working in. So um, that's uh, a reason to, to uh, make sure. In fact, if you publish as a creationist, you'll be fired within weeks if you manage to get a paper published in a secular journal because they've been all saying, oh, we never, you never see a creationist in a secular journal. Well, some of them publish under false names to be able to be published. Some of them do get published and then they pay a heavy price. And I have... There's a book called The Slaughter of the Dissidents that goes through that. So anyway, there are many organizations. Uh, oh, I didn't show it on the screen. Uh, Institute Creation Research, Creation Research Society. The difference is, you know, we may have $2 million total of everybody, $2, $3 million max to do research, whereas they have $2, $3 billion to do research. Uh, they're not getting very far ahead with the, that much money, but they have lots of faith. So Anyway, it's not true that all science, but most scientists, of course, are because it's, it's the paradigm. That, and most science at work, they don't have nothing to do with evolution. You're working on plastics and chemistry. They may say, I'm an evolutionist, but he has, he's not doing anything in, associated with evolution. So that's just keep that in mind. All right, where does evolution come from? Why do we get these people that are believing? Well, it goes back to the Greeks. Actually, I have a, a new talk of how it actually goes back to the Hindus because the Greek philosophy actually comes from Hindu philosophy. But I can't get into that right now. Uh, but it's, it's super interesting to see how the Eastern uh, thought processes of reincarnation and um, evolution, actually, in Hinduism, uh, greatly affected the Greeks. And then, of course, everybody based their thought processes on the Greeks right up until now, and so it's slipped in there. But anyway, let's, let's talk, see how there's evidence of evolutionary thought uh, right way back. This is like 500 years before Christ. And uh, an examander of Miletus, he says this. Um, he, he's the first one that we have where we have written, written evidence, right? The first living, things suddenly, first living things suddenly emerged in water, and then later on some of them left the water, adapted to life on land, and began to live there. Sounds pretty modern. <laughs> Sounds pretty modern. Uh, here we've got uh, Lucretius. He says, concerning atoms, as you know, the word atoms came from the Greek to unite in every way and essay everything that they might create, meeting one another. Therefore, it comes to pass that scattered abroad through a great age, took a lot of time, as they try meetings in motion. In other words, the fact that they're hitting themselves together and conflicting, they, they apparently in his thought, things were happening. And at last, those come together, which suddenly hold together, cast together, and become often the beginnings of great things, earth, sea, sky, and the race of living things. So he has everything coming from these little things that he doesn't even know what they are, that are just accumulating in boom life what's not funny is that we actually teach that at high school we teach that non-living molecules will become living cells which is flagrant lie the law of biogenesis is against it life comes from life no one can show anything the opposite it's it's a discontinuity that is so profound that 
any model that comes up against this should be instantly dropped. And yet it's taught. Now why? The only reason it's taught is the long war against God. That's the only reason. It's like when they talk about a flood. You can have a worldwide flood on Mars, no problem. But you can't have a worldwide flood on Earth. Okay. Natural selection. So I will take one second. I'm going to take a little bit longer. We'll probably go over the 45 minutes for sure. Um, if you don't mind, if you'll be patient with me just a bit, because I'm only here once and I... I have a captive audience. Can we, do you lock the doors when you preach? No. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, anyway, so I just want to explain what natural selection is because lots of people have ideas and I just want to give you an analogy. It's a simple analogy, but it, it is really sort of how natural selection works. If, if I took this room, your population, people, you work all well, and let's say if I divide it here, I'm not picking on anybody, I don't know any of you. So let's say here are the people that are intelligent and here you have strength. <laughs> Together... Together, you're surviving well, okay? You're working well. You have more genes. You all have a bit of intelligence. You all have a bit of strength. It's just that you have special abilities and strength, and you have special abilities and intelligence. So what is natural selection? Natural selection is a 24-hour deadly flu comes in, hits your population, and selects among you. 24 hours, who's going to lose out here? Which side, intelligent or strength? <laughs> I don't know what he said, but I'm sure I'm not going to repeat it. Okay. <laughs> so, who's going to lose out? The intelligent or the strength? The intelligent. Sorry, I have to get rid of someone. No, the strengths are, are they're going to automatically resist. The intelligence No, they won't have time. 24 hours. That's why I put it short. Okay. So you've selected, right? That's natural select. You've selected, but are you more advanced? No, you're less advanced. You've lost something. Selection, you always lose from what is there. You do not build. So natural selection is not a way to go from anything, to, to perfect anything. It'll help you survive. Yes, but you're not more advanced. Okay, so it's important to understand. So here we have Darwin. He goes to the Galapagos, collects all kinds of samples, but he does notice these finches, and the finches uh, are affected by the size of the nuts. So if the nuts are small and hard, they need to have a hard beak. Other, the ones with the softer beaks just don't survive. They get selected for but the code, genetic, he doesn't know this, but the genetic code for both beaks are contained in the population. So when they got, whether they were blown on an island by a wind that was like that, or whether it was just the climate that got drier, same thing. When the nuts got bigger, then you have more of the birds with the, with the, the be beaks that were uh, smaller and could handle the, the, um, the it, all, well, all beaks could handle it, but you might give an advantage to those that were uh, didn't have the problems with the little nuts. So he observes some of that, and uh, it was actually, they actually, and he, he took that, the problem was he took this concept and, and expanded it and said, from beaks and nuts, we're going to get bacteria to human or monkeys to man. That part's the fabulation. That's the imaginary part that we're dealing with that doesn't make any sense. And you get people that, around the same time as Darwin, who, t who say, I've got evidence. The horse. And you get this horse series that they put up. Well, what's the ch what are the problems with the horse series? Well, first of all, the bones of the oldest horses are near the surface. Well, it should be the opposite. There are living horses with multiple toes, because it goes from multiple toes to single toes. Um, Peoapis uh, is found along with Equus, so he's found along with his... Um, uh, Equus is the one we have today. This is horse today in Latin. And so these two are actually found, these fossils are found together. So he didn't evolve from it. They're, still, they're both living at the same time. Genetics and ribs vary from 15 to 19, and then settles at 18. It like goes up and down. So that it doesn't look like they evolved. And we have great variability in horses today that are equus. So, and in fact, evolutionists recognize um, more recently that this doesn't make any sense. Darwin, uh, David Rapp says, Darwin was embarrassed by the fossil record. We are now about 120 years after Darwin and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. Some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of the more detailed information. This was published in 1979 in Natural History, which is a very reputable uh, scientific journal. 
Uh, and yet, that horror series is still in our textbooks today. Ernst Tegel had a great effect. When I, you know, we're answering the question, why do scientists believe this? Well, Ernst Haeckel, he has this thing about embryos. And by the way, this is the basis, scientific basis, on the justification, justification of abortion. Ernst Haeckel, he's a biologist. He, he's a member of 90 sci scientific societies and academies. This guy's no dummy. He's really, really smart. Uh, however, he was a little bit too enthusiastic about evolution. And if you look at the picture on the, the drawing on the uh, left, on your left, he put that in an article and he says, the embryos of humans recapitulate evolution. And so at some point, the, evolution, the, the, the fetus will be, the, the embryo will look like the embryo of a fish, a salamander, uh, a duck, a chicken. You can see at the end there, like, see, see, you got like a duck here. I'm pointing to that side, sorry for people here. So you got a duck like here, and then you have like a pig, and then eventually you have a human. That's why, and this has been going a long time, this was in textbooks up to year 2000 and even longer. So the problem is, this is a fraud. It was known to be a fraud since 1937, maybe earlier, but it was known. He was judged on it by his university in 1937, which is a long time ago. And it was in books. It's still in books, I probably. And the problem was, this is reality. If you see on the right-hand side, look at the fish embryo, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, human. They don't look anything like what he put up there. And there's also issues about him in the fish ones where he actually put multiple different embryos from different fish together to give it a look. It's like a puzzle fish. Um, and so it's a fraud. It was presented at the Scopes trial as evidence also. Uh, it's been many, many books, and unfortunately, it should never be there. And in fact, even Stephen Gould, the late Stephen Gould, he says, should be astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not the majority, of modern textbooks. Now, they're the basis of evolution because if the embryo is just recapitulating, uh, they're the basis of abortion, because if the embryo is just recapitulating evolution, then at what point are you actually aborting a human? So it has other impacts that are much greater than. Now, Darwin, this is how big it was. Darwin said embryology is to me by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of the change of forms. It's big, it's big. But there was no evidence so he made up something to give it evidence. Darwin said, oh, great, finally I've got something. And then it went on in our textbooks, and it's all they had. All right. This, this, this desire to believe evolution without having the facts leads us to things like this, the Piltdown Man, which is a, just a few kilometers from the door of Darwin. See, Darwin said we should be tripping over our ancestors when we walk out of the door. And I mean like fossils of our ancestors, because there should be so many over millions of years, they should be packing out the ground. He said, we haven't found them yet, but we will find them. So, isn't it interesting, 50 years after, and they didn't find any, they were looking for missing links, of course, human, monkey, they didn't have anything for 50 years after his theory. So his theory is getting in trouble, honestly. And then, funnily enough, a couple of kilometers from his doorstep, they find the missing link <laughs> called Piltdown Man. And it's big. Uh, New York Times, Sunday, December 22nd, 1912. Look at that on the left. Darwin theory is proved true. It's about, uh, it's, it's about Piltdown Man. What does it say? It says, uh, thought to be a woman's uh, creature could not talk. That's obviously a contradiction, could not be possible. Um, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, they, didn't, they weren't quite as advanced as we are. Um, so that was the, uh, what was put in the culture. And what did they really find? Well, they found a few uh, skull pieces. A great big... Uh, jaw that was clearly not human, uh, some canine teeth. We don't have canine teeth. So they said, this is a human skull with a um, jaw of an ape. And so put it together, and we've got Piltdown Man. We've got the, the missing link and some top scientists. See, these are scientists that believe in evolution. Some of them, one of them published over 600 papers. Uh, not on this, but in his field. Uh, they studied the actual bones, and they didn't see that the teeth were filed. They didn't see that the bones were artificially aged. Why didn't they see it? Well, because their faith had blinded them. Eventually, it comes out in 1949, but it's published in 1956 in Reader's Digest, that it's a fraud. It took 40 years, but the damage was done. The theologians collapsed. Scope's trial. Uh, it, it, 
evolution of man is now, that's the missing link. That's all they had. And it was a fraud. You notice today, no one talks about ape men. I'm not saying that no one talks that men can act like apes. I'm just saying that ape men, no one talks about. They just talk about southern monkeys. They talk about Australopithecines. They talk about monkeys that are 3 million, 4 million, 10 million years that are supposed to be our ancestors, chimps, etc. That's all they talk about. Why not? Because they don't have anything in the middle. Number four. We're good? Everybody still holding on? Let's move. Life will appear, can appear without a creator. Well, that's the Millie Yuri experience. They're trying to get that life from non life. So this doesn't work, period. <laughs> it just doesn't work. He tried his best, though. Uh, we have amino acids that are the basis of DNA, and he's trying to get them together to make a beginning of a DNA if he can. The problem here is that this isn't one of the many problems. Uh, he actually created sort of like tar, which isn't a great beginning of life, but still, he tried. He puts this electric current, and there's hot water. Number one issue, if you want molecules to get together to become uh, uh, atoms, or et cetera, to get together to become, yeah, molecules to get together to become atom, um, uh, amino acids. That's what I'm getting. Amino acids, which are the basis of protein. Uh, you want them to come together, you don't do it in hot water. Because, you know, when I was a single, when I was single, which I've been married 28 years, but when I was single uh, and at universities, especially at university, um, and I'm sure this, no, no, gu no guys, on, maybe some guys will relate to this. I sort of did the dishes when there was no dishes left in the cupboard. And it's a guy thing. And I may have eaten eggs sometime before, and then, you know, they're in the sink, and now I have to get the egg off, right? And so what are we going to do when we get the egg off? We're going to put what? What type of water? Hot water, because water is a solvent, and hot, hot speeds it up. But a solvent means it dissolves. But you don't try to build something in an environment that's dissolving. And in fact, they can't, it doesn't work. They have to have a system. You'll see number five there, number five. That's actually a place where they put in a, 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 a pipette to pull out anything that's created because if they left anything that was created in there, it would dissolve. So it's not a good environment to show this. <laughs> okay, so you're not getting life. And there's other problems like, uh, like changing slides. Okay, uh, homocry homochirality, which has to do with the fact that amino acids have a left and right hand shape, and it's, the shape is super important. Your protein, it's not just a question of a bunch of amino acids, it's that your proteins have shapes. And we're sort of used to that thinking about enzymes, you know, being a key and lock, and they have specific shapes. Well, it's the same thing with proteins. They have shapes, and they're shaped. And uh, in, in life, only left-handed proteins occur. But whenever we try to create uh, amino acids, we always get 50-50. But we can't even have one that's the wrong shape, because if it gets into the line, it's going to be the, the rest of it's the wrong shape. And so it won't build the protein, even if you manage to get a thousand of them in the right order. And that's the next issue. What's the simplest life form? Can we get down to something really simple? Well, this is the simplest life form that's able to, well, it's, not, it's a virus, so it's not even really working on its own, but let's forget that. 40, 468 genes. We can't, we, and it has a length of 1,000 bases, which means 468,000 uh, uh, amino acids in a specific order, okay? Now I want to give you an idea of what that means. This is a puzzle that's 1,000 pieces, okay? This is a puzzle that's 5,000 pieces. Someone very courageous. This is a puzzle that's 100,000 pieces. Someone who has too much time. And, <laughs> and there is no, pu there, I, I've never heard of any, a puzzle that's higher, but we're talking about something that's uh, four and a half times the size of this. In a specific order, every single amino acid has to be the right one in the order. Okay, is that going to come around on its own? So they started taking pieces out and say, let's imagine that we didn't have this. Like if you have a car, can, you, can it still work as a car without a steering wheel? Yeah, sure. It has to have an engine, but you can get rid of the top. It's called a convertible. You know, you can get rid of pieces, but there's a, like a limit you can, um, Eventually, you have to have like tires, <laughs> you have to have an axle, you have to have like a minimal. Uh, so same thing with the cell. You have to have a minimal. They came down to 250. When they published this, uh, oh, you don't see that. When they published that there were 250 genes were a minimal, that's still 250,000 pieces. When they said that was the minimal, I said, no, it's not. I bet it's going to go up. Two years later, and I predicted that. And it did, 397. So now we're 397 genes out of 468 are essential to the life. Why? Because 
It, you can't build it from a piece at a time. The whole system has to work at once. You have to have the membrane, you have to create the energy, you have to system deal with the energy, you have the system to get rid of the garbage, you have to have all these have to work at once. The chicken and rooster came first. Okay, DNA. Information is a coded message. I'm not going to talk a lot about DNA, but I am going to show you something about it that's really important. That is, DNA is all about information. Now, when I see a poem, I know there's a poet. When I see a book, there's always an author. When I see a program, invariably, there's a programmer. And we have a program here that needs to, to, to work. It gets transcribed to take it out of the nucleus so it so the nucleus doesn't break apart, it gets translated, they make a copy of it, take it out, and then it gets translated to become the amino acids in a chemical process. Wait a second, translation sounds like what domain of knowledge? I heard it. Language, language, linguistics. Whenever there's linguistics, it means you have a message and uh, a broadcast and a reception. And both sides have to understand it. If I spoke to you in French, which I could do because my wife doesn't speak English and I live in Quebec, if I spoke to you in French, unless you've had a little bit of education in French, you wouldn't understand what I said, right? Because though I have a message and it's perfectly valid, you aren't able to receive it. So in the biological world, you have to have the systems working at once for it to be used, right? If you don't, it has to all work at once, period. <laughs> Let, let's show, a, we're going to try to show a little video of this. Just a, I don't know if there's any music in the cell. Count how, many, count how many times there's a word uh, machine. Can you turn up the sound? Thanks. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. All right. They must have said machine five times, and that's not counting the allusions to something that builds and assembles, etc. above that. Clearly, this isn't something that could be come about by chance. So, why do evolutionists believe it? Well, they have They've been told something, and a lot of them have just accepted it. 
Other ones, it's because they want to keep their job and feed their family. And even though they doubt it, because many doubters have lost their job also, just because they doubted it without ever being creationist. Okay, number five. How do we get all the new species in such a short time after the global flood? Right, we got lots of, on the flood they had archetypes. I'll get to that. Okay, let me, before, because I already have the answer, right? So <laughs> I'll try to tell it to you before I show it. So you have the ark. Well, it's not the ark. It's the model of the ark. Uh, Noah's ark can hold at least 1,800, 180,000, I mean, animals. It's big. It's like a football field times three. And Noah didn't take the, well, he didn't take anything. They were brought to him. But the animals, he wants them to be reproducing, right? When he gets there, they, when he gets out, he's going to reproduce. So he's not going to take the old ones. I have nothing against old, I'm part of the senior people now too. Though my friend Dave, when we went to the aquarium today, he got the discount. I wasn't senior enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, uh, the, the situation is that there's lots of room for archetypes. Like if we talk dinosaurs, there are only 75 types of dinosaurs. So he'd only need 150 dinosaurs. He wouldn't, most dino at any rate, all the dinosaurs we find, the average height is a pony. Sauropods are big, but they all start off with eggs that are this size. So you take the small ones, lots of room on the ark. I, I, can, I, I can like hear people thinking. Okay, uh, so possible patterns. What, what, what could have happened? Because it's a little bit of hypothesis. No one's there. We don't know exactly what happened. We have to work backwards. Keeping in mind, as I mentioned before, that the genetics were perfect up to the flood, then things start going bad, right? Shem only lived 600 years total, 500 years after the flood. Uh, three, the grandson of Noah. Uh, uh, next one, what would you call the next one? In French, we say Aria Petit Fils. In, in English, it would be, well, what would be the next? Great grandson. That's what I'm looking for. Great grandson and great great grandson, they all live like 425 years. That's a total disaster for Noah. Think of it. If, you, if we all lived to like 100 years, but our grandchildren only never made it past 42 years, that would be a disaster. Right now, we don't even make it to puberty for Noah. He's living 1,000 years, 950. We're not even making it like to get married. Okay? So, so we, so we know the genetics, but then after that, it's like a disaster after. It has to do with radiation, has to do with the telomeres on our cells that are being affected and, and accumulation of mutations that are happening afterwards. So we don't know exactly how, uh, what happened. We have to make some hypothesis. So what are the choices? The choices is that right after the flood, there was a vast modification, or there are several choices here, of types of, say, dogs. They start with the old, well, dogs are an exception. So let's go to beetles. I don't know. Beetles weren't on the ark. I'm trying to think of something. Rabbits. Uh, there'd be a vast change of different types of animals as they spread out over the world post-flood. Okay, they get off the boat and they spread out. Or they, I think, honestly, I think there were boats floating around. These guys knew how to build boats. I think one of the reasons why Madagascar has such a flora, uh, flora and fauna that's different from anywhere else in the world is because when they left with a boat with people on it, like maybe the sons of Noah, they stopped off there first because it was along the coast of Africa. Water's going down and they got off. And a lot of the stuff is very, it, it doesn't make any sense from anybody's point of view, but it does make sense if you took it from the ark and came down. But uh, the other per option is that they had, uh, they were very slow, like the reverse here. So all of a sudden, boom, things happened here. And then you have the in-between, so that's called the explosive, then you have the late, and then you have the episodic, that means it, it happens uh, in bursts, and then you have the linear. So those are the different options we have. I think there may be a combination. I think there's some validity to this idea, honestly, for humans, actually. I think there's some validity to this. Um, and I think there's some validity to this around animals, as I'll show in a moment. One of the reasons why I say this about humans, I'm the, but, you know, I'm, I'm just me, so I'm just thinking. Um, when we look at uh, the skin color differences, which is more than just skin color in the genes, it's, it's, it's whole facial aspects and the things like that, which are basically melanin, right, the, the darkness of the skin, we notice that it's related to where you are based on the equator, right? You get darker and darker, get lighter and lighter. It's just melanin, protects us from sun, but there are other aspects that the genes are connected to, doesn't matter. We know that it doesn't change now. It's been like four or five hundred years that Germans have been living in South Africa. They're not getting any darker, right? So it's whatever it is has stabilized, but wasn't stabilized before. Why? Because when the genes are perfect, they're very plastic. Well, it's a expression, scientific expression. They're, they're, they're quite flexible. But the more errors you get on your genetic code, the less flexible you come, become for adaptation. 
and you don't really adapt to the environment. So there's a whole science called epigenetics, which is being developed that not many people know about. But we're just starting to understand um, some of these aspects. So I think that there, there's a good possibility that shortly after the flood, as people were, uh, certainly after the Tower of Babel, uh, as people were going out over the world, there was some adaptation taking place associated with the environment that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so I think there's some of that, but there's definitely some of the bottom one, and I'll sh even show you a video explaining that. Um, and and some of even some respond to this, like the deer kind is a specific scenario where there's 55 species of deer. It's one new species every 80 years, and it does seem to match the trend, in a recent trend where it's straight, but it's not always that. Um, I want to show this one video. Or is it two? I think it's two. We're talking about rapid speciation. Just a couple minutes. Some answers in Genesis. Camels and llamas, so different and living on different continents, yet able to breed together and produce young. Examples abound of species that can be bred together. Zebras with horses. Tigers with lions. Potatoes with hot peppers and so on. This amazes biologists. Based on modern rates of change, new species should quickly lose their ability to interbreed with other species. So, modern species that interbreed must have formed recently and rapidly. It's amazing that camels and llamas, though separated by oceans and thousands of miles, came from the same parents in relatively recent times. So how could such major changes have arisen so rapidly? This is a mystery to biologists because they don't see such widespread rapid change today. And they don't know of any natural process that can create the biological information necessary for such changes. The biblical account of creation may provide the answer to this mystery. Breeders have long known that domesticated plants and animals possess a huge reserve of information that can produce a stunning variety of shapes and functions. Most modern dogs, for example, came from just a handful of breeds in the 1600s. And these dogs have a wide range of features that suit them for a wide variety of environments, from sledding at the poles to hunting in the desert. And none of that variety was put there by humans. The information was already built into the dogs. Such variety of information can be found in cattle, pheasants, pigeons, apples, orchids, and many other domesticated plants and animals. If all the non-domesticated animals on the ark had this same wealth of information, then we could understand how a single pair of cats could produce all known cats. Today, crossbreeding between domestic cats and wild cats, between cougars and leopards, between lions and tigers indicate that all modern cat species are the same created kind. The original cat kind carried all the information necessary to build the variety of cats we see today. But where did this information come from in the first place? The Bible reveals that God created all the animal and plant kinds in the beginning. And we're now learning that God placed a huge amount of information within each created kind allowing them to diversify into the myriad of plants and animals we see today. The information was there, all there, right from the start. This is not evolution from a lower form of life. It's creation by an all-knowing, all-powerful, infinitely wise creator who is worthy of our worship and praise. All right, so uh, that's... Uh some information I've got. <laughs> I got. Won't, I won't do this one because we don't have time. But uh, basically, uh, they were discussing an article that came out that where they published that basically you can explain all life forms we have within the last 200,000 years, which is a blink of an eye evolutionary. And it, and it causes them a trouble because they, they say themselves, we don't understand this. We can explain all the, the time it takes to, to speciate, to, to become species. By the way, species is not the same thing as kinds. Kinds in the Bible is a family. It's like a phyla. Whereas the uh, species is like the lower, your, your different uh, dogs and things like that. They're all different species. So uh, they just showed that you can get everything within 200,000 years, which is a blink of an eye. We're asking it for, of course, faster than that. But for them, that's fast. And it doesn't make any sense in their model. Okay. We ready for a couple more? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, the six of you that said yes, I appreciate it. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll run through these. Uh, carbon dating shows the Bible is wrong, does it? Okay, so carbon dating, you have like C14, uh, you get a little extra photon here. C14 is radioactive, normally carbon is C12, right? 12, um, and it comes down, it goes into the plants, something eats the plants, then they die. Normally people, things that are dead don't eat anymore. So at that point, the C14 starts breaking down, and the idea is they analyze the, the amount and see how much it, and try to figure out how long it's been breaking down. Okay, so the curve would look something like this, if I can get it to show on the screen. Uh, it has a half-life of 5,730 years. So half the carbon is gone in 5,000, almost 6,000 years, and then another half, so now we're down to a quarter, understand the curve, then you're down to an eighth, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, around 80,000, you have no more detectable carbon, at least not with our machines. It's, it just keeps going down until it's gone. So what does that mean? That means if you find carbon in dinosaur bones, then that dinosaur isn't 65 million years old. I have done that five times with Vance Nelson. We got it carbon dated. We didn't tell them it was a dinosaur bone. They wouldn't have dated it. We didn't tell them we were creationists. They wouldn't have dated it. That's okay. They dated it. And uh, there's lots of soft tissue in dinosaurs and stuff. All kinds of things are bringing this into question. But, uh, but clearly, carbon-14 can't be used for things that are millions of years old. Right? There's no carbon. Okay. So this is what's interesting here. If we were looking at there, now I know that's small for people on the screen, but what it's saying here, those are millions of years here, 600 million years, beginning of life for evolutionists. So clearly what they're saying here is that what would we predict? We would predict that anything under 100,000 years is going to have no carbon, right? Because it's gone. Well, isn't it strange that if we look at coal, wood, even fossils like ammonites, okay, what do we find, if I can get this change? Okay, we find significant amounts of carbon in all of it. It's supposed to be like 300 million years old, but it's got carbon, so it can't be 300 million years old, can it? You get them in diamonds, you get them all kinds of stuff. It goes on and on. There are 15,000 published dates in the journal Radiocarbon of material that should be hundreds of millions of years old, but it has radiocarbon in it. All right. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Next question. How could Noah have put all the animals on the ark? Isn't that for room? Well, we sort of already talked about that, right? So I won't, go, uh, I won't go too much into that. But just to say the size of the ark, about 500 feet, if you're still using feet, uh, 85, 51. It's the right dimensions to float. The idea is not, it's not an ocean liner that's planning to go from point A to point B. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's floating. So it's the right thing to float. It's, a, it's the right dimensions. But it's big. It could fit 522 rail cars. And is space a problem? Well, let's look at this. I know this might be a bit small, but I'll, I'll for those in the back, but here's the deal. These are all the estimates of creatures on Earth today, about 1.7 million species. That would be a problem on the ark. But first of all, God didn't say everything was on the ark. He didn't put fish on the ark. There weren't a bunch of aquariums. No fish. There weren't insects. Well, at least there didn't need to be insects. Because what it God says in Genesis, he says it's everything that breathed that went on the ark. Insects don't breathe. So what went on? Mammals, birds, and reptiles. Sorry, that should be a bit bigger. So the size here is really, really small. It's just about 23,000. Okay? Today's species, now, I'm not, you know, it could be less than that. Uh, but how many animals? So you, you go back to the archetypes of all these types, two of every kind of the whole family, right? Because they're the families that go on, the basis of what comes out. And the space in the ark, there's a book called Noah's Ark, a feasibility study that goes through the calculations and sees, says you could have between 16,000 and 35,000 animals on the ark. Now they're not, they're going to go into hibernation really quick. Noah's not going out, he's not mucking out like 35,000 animals. So he's, um, uh, they're, they're going to go into hibernation and um, so he doesn't have to feed them for just a, just a couple of days. And then uh, there's lots of room. So that's that. We got enough room. Feed, waste, hibernation, whoop, uh, is all going to be looked after. So let's go to eight. 
There never was a global flood. We mentioned that. It can be on Mars, not here. Let's take a look at some geological and historical arguments, just really quick. Uh, the terrestrial relief, ca relief cannot be explained with the present processes. It, it, they're all catastrophic. I like to ask the evolutionist, where's the erosion in these strata? So if we look at this, uh, you know, you ha the idea is you have uniformitarianism, which is the idea that all these formed over long, vast periods of time. And then you have catastrophism that all these formed at the same time during the year of the flood. And some after the flood as the water is going down. Okay, you do have some. Uh, now the problem is here, and it's a really, really easy, the questions are so easy, so basic. I, I like to pester my evolutionary colleagues. And I say, look, where's the erosion in these strata? If this strata is like 50,000 years old, and this one's 100,000 years old, how did you get no erosion during 100,000 years? Everywhere in the world. That doesn't make any sense. It's not my model. And I went to Switzerland. I was on a talk, uh, doing a talk series in Switzerland and uh, in a church in Oron la ville And um, the Monday, so I'd given a whole series of talks at this church, a brethren church, and uh, uh, Monday he took me up the Rhone Valley and we, um, up this direction, and I saw this, the sun had just fallen on it correctly, and I said, being from Eastern Canada, you guys will understand this right away. I said, that's great, why don't we go there? <laughs> it's like when our first time we went to Calgary, went to Calgary, we said we saw some mountains, oh, we're gonna go there, and two and a half hours later, we still hadn't gotten there. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> this isn't like in Quebec. All right, so, we did go, we got, got closer, and uh, I got close enough to focus in on this here. It's pretty bizarre, it makes like a noise when I do a... Okay, it does, how, do, how come it makes a noise? <laughs> okay, anyway, this here is, um, uh, you see the, how the strata are folded, like in 180 degrees? Is there, it's a sandwich, it's being sandwiched. So the strata were laid down flat, and then you had two massive, this is the Alps, it's like the Rockies, right? You got the two massive forces that are taking all this and folding it at a, at like a sandwich. This is the Jurassic. This has fossils in it. It's not like some slow process with rock that moved that would be all, you'd see all kinds of fissures and crack and, and the, the fossils would be burned out. No, this happened, the fossils are there, it's because it was all soft when it got done. And it means that the, the strata here is the same age as the strata here. So, we're talking about global floods here. We're talking about there's strata that go, the chalk strata that are in K Texas, Canada, Israel, Germany, uh, England, Germany, and France, uh, go down to India, end up in Australia. Same stuff, worldwide. The trilobites, now I know, we're in, I know more about Western, Eastern Canada, of course, than here, but the trilobites um, that we have in Eastern Canada, if I go to Ottawa at the Carleton University, you can go down by the river and take a little hammer and and uh, a screwdriver, and, and you'll have this rock that sort of, it actually smells like oil, and they're black, they're, they're what were taken out when they put in the, the, uh, the old train, and it's on the side of the river, you get it, and you'll find trilobites. Well, those exact same formations, those trilobites, you can find all the way down to Texas. Because it's worldwide, it's continental, it's, it's big, really, really big. Uh, this, however, does, uh, my understanding is this comes from the Rockies, Okay, so obviously very rapid, catastrophic. This is not a slow process. Here we have, I took this picture when I was in Joggins in Nova Scotia, uh, where you clearly see this plant. Uh, well, it's not a plant, it's a tree. The tree here, uh, it's not going to allow, it, it's not gonna allow itself to be fossilized as a rock from the roots up for 100,000 years. That's all happened at the same time. It's called polystrate fossils. It's fast. How about this? We got this as fast deposition. Uh, layers would not yet be consolidated and bend while underwater. Well, so, so they could, they, it doesn't work without a flood environment. You have even the fossils like this, uh, the nautiloid, oh, I got French here. <laughs> the fossil, the nautiloid fossils are actually lined up because they, they were all buried at once over a period of like 800 square miles, all in the same direction approximately, because they were in a mud flow that was like the size of two states, okay? We have uh, these fossil graveyards, two meters thick, millions of nautiloids, that's what I just talked about, covering, oh, not, uh, yeah, 11,000, excuse me, 11,000 square miles uh, in the red limestone. How about, what would you expect if you had a, a flood that covered the mountains? Well, you'd expect the top of mountains to have marine fossils, so at the top of Mount Everest, you have marine fossils. 
just follows. Why, if it didn't happen, do all the tribes in the world talk about a global flood? Or a flood? All of them. Don't all of them talk about Noah. Some do. Look at our $20 bill. This is the Inuit model. You have eight, eight persons, eight things on the boat. Why eight? Why does the Hindu uh, Vishnu, he comes out of the flood, because they don't know what happened before the flood. He comes out of the flood in a cosmic egg. Him, three gods, four goddesses. Why? Because Noah brought with him his three sons and their four wives. And so the number eight everywhere is ubiquitous with the, with the story of the flood. In fact, that's why you have the number nine. Nine, or in French it's neuf, it's even clearer, it means new. Why everything starts new? It's even in our numbers. Uh, in Turkish, there's a whole linguistic thing around this. But anyway, just to say, the number eight is everywhere. Even in Chinese letters, it's actually ingrained in their letters where, as you know, the pictograms are, um, uh, uh, have stories behind them. So if you undo the, the, the image for a vessel, seagoing vessel, it's eight mouths on a boat. Yes, and why do you always put eight people on your boat? They don't know. Great opportunity. Okay, geological, we're nine, we're almost there. Nine geological errors in the fossil record. So how do we explain geological errors, right? We talked about this. Uh, we're supposed to have the 600 of these living organisms. Well, do th does this really exist anywhere? Well, actually, it doesn't really exist anywhere. Uh, first of all, I want to make two things straight that even I didn't know until after university. And I didn't study geology. I was into agronomy. And in plant science, I studied soils, but not you know, historical geology so much. Um, I sort of had the idea that these ages were related to the type of rock, like the color, redstone, granites, and things like that color. And sometimes it can look like that, but the reality is these names have nothing to do with the rock. Precambrian, which you don't see here, but Precambrian just means there's no fossils. Cambrian means you have specific type of fossils. In fact, every single age here, Jurassic, and that's why they put the pictures, every single age has to do with the fossils that are in it, has nothing to do with the rock, the type of rock. Okay, that's important to know. So, do we get these layers of fossils lined up like this anywhere in the world? There may be four places, 0.4%, uh, maybe, that was published by Wood Moropi. I'm not sure it really exists, but certainly it isn't the rule. The rule is that most of the around the world you have one to three layers and that's it. And it doesn't necessarily mean one to three layers in sequence. If we take the famous Grand Canyon, what they have here is you'll see here you have some Cambrian and then you have some Devonian and you go up, you have this section up on top. In the middle, you're missing 125 million years and you're missing it. It's not there. And it's not like you're walking through a Grand Canyon and you have rock here and then you have like this space and things are floating in the air. They're on top of each other. You can't even put a, a paper between that strata. It's gone. It's not there. That doesn't make any sense from an evolutionary point of view, but it does make sense in a flood. Okay, and again, it's based on the fossils, not on the type. So, what would be your what would be your idea if we were talking? Okay, what would be your prediction if we had a fossil record created by the flood? Well we would expect basically what they really see, which is this. Stephen Gould says, the extreme rarity of transitional forms. We would expect there are no transitional forms because God didn't create transitional forms because we have nothing going outside. The, 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 the categories are staying within that category. So he says, this is what we actually see. It's, he says, a trade secret. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of the branches. The rest is inference. In other words, all the missing links however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. He says most species exhibit no directional change during their tenure on Earth. Harvard paleontologist. They appear in the fossil record looking much the same as when they disappear. Hmm. Where's the evidence for evolution exactly? I'm still looking for it. Morphological change is usually limited and directionless. And then he says this. No matter what the local zonation, species do not appear gradually. So rather, they appear suddenly and fully formed. Oh, okay. Cambrian, uh, the Cambrian explosion, where the fossils actually come from BC. Uh, you have all these, including trilobites. You have all these creatures suddenly there, fully formed, no, no pre, and they've got tons of information on them. Where'd the information come? How, how do you do that? Now, they, th w they talk, you know, suddenly appear. I don't think they appear. They suddenly drown, okay? 
That's what happened. So uh, they closed to 35 phalums. In other words, they got 35 basic branches that are already represented, boom, right there at the beginning. Why? Well, th there is no evolution. That's why. So you got mollusks, bacteriopods, antipods, synodaria. We can keep on. But let me show you some evidence from the fossils. Let's go to the fossil record. Up there is a fossil that's supposed to be 161 million years old, but it's a salamander. And it looks like a, we can identify that without any real advanced course because we have living salamanders and they haven't changed in 161 million years. Where's the advanced? Frogs. Hey, man. They're not becoming princes. They've always been frogs. 100 million years ago, that's a frog. That's a frog today. I'm sorry, gals. Even if you kiss frogs, they don't become princes. So, and you see, there's just no evidence. The, the fossil record is not the friend of evolutionists. And then we get the soft tissue in dinosaurs. So since 1917, I actually have some, not here, but at home. I have soft tissue. In other words, I have cells of dinosaurs, of triceratops, that you can look at in a mic light microscope because it's not fossilized, and you can see the bone cells. Not fossilized. And there's tons of this. Tons of this um, of soft tissue. That's why I got a radiocarbon date. Oh, I didn't tell you that. I got a radiocarbon date of 32,000, 28 to 30 to 32,000, which is a significant amount of carbon. There's a reason why it's not 4,500, whatever. Uh, I can't go into that right now. But the thing is, it's a long way from 65 million. Um, and the, f the reason is, is because there's carbon. Otherwise, carbon, carbon date's organic. It's not a mineral date, right? It's carbon is organic. You're made of carbon. Um, and so the fact that, and, and carbon doesn't, you, you can't keep these things around. Blood vessels, uh, collagen, you can't keep it around for 65 million years. How did it disintegrate? DNA. Just not reasonable. Analysis of bone cells confirms ancient protein preservations. How, did, how, how do you do that? That's what I like to ask them. It's sometimes hard to tell which is a fossil and which is fresh. <laughs> okay, seems to fit my model. Seems to. Is the fossil record in contradiction to creation theory? No. Last, this is the penultimate argument for evolutionists. Antibiotic resistance. Okay, so this is the last one. Resistance to antibiotics is considered the unanswerable argument against creation and for evolution. They're seeing evolution in action. Someone forgot to ask them if the bacteria actually changed into anything else. Uh, no, they did not. But they say, you know, given enough time. If Christians had as much faith as my evolutionary friends, the world would be saved a long time ago. Okay. Uh, being a bit facetious. The most solid example of evolution, the development of antibiotic resistance, they do billions of dollars or millions of dollars of research on this. Well, it's probably up close to a billion uh, on antibiotic resistance because it's so important for us for hospitals right now. Now, first of all, you have to understand how antibiotic resistance occurs. Now, keep it, it's antibiotic, right? In other words, you put a substance in that's going to kill the bacteria. That's the goal, right? Most antibiotics we use are not selective. In other words, they kill all the bacteria, which is why they... You take it like for 10 days, but then you say stop taking it because you're killing your good ones too. And we're like 95% good against 5% bad. So the, uh, the antibiotic, but then we have ones that survive the whatever we put in. That's, we say, well, the ones that survived. Now the thing is, is I call it the inside out principle. You put something in, if it survived, it's not because it changed, it's because it had the information already internally to uh, give it the ability to survive or it would have been eliminated. It didn't like, oh, here comes something. I'm going to add on a bunch of genes and new information. Uh -huh. It doesn't work that way. It's inside out. The information has to be there first. It's sort of like what the film was talking about. So let me show you how this works. Most antibiotic resistance has to do with the bacteria not working properly as a bacteria. In other words, what happens is the membrane gets inhibited, so the drug hits the, the membrane is less, absorbing less, so it doesn't get eliminated. But now it's, the bacteria lives by absorption of its environment. So it's become less active. You understand what I mean? It's become less effective as a bacteria to be able to survive. That's not a more advanced bacteria. So antibiotic resistance, uh, yeah, it makes what they call superbugs. <sighs> you might get this idea from Hollywood, you know, superbugs, all you get the big bugs. Come on, it's the same bacteria, it just survived. 
okay? <laughs> There's no super bug. <laughs> it's just that it survived. It's the same bacteria. And it often survived because of reasons like this. And look, I'll prove it to you. And <laughs> things like this, I don't know if you can see this, but they tested some stuff they found that was over 5,000 years old, and it was already resistant to the antibiotics, modern antibiotics. Why? Because our modern antibiotics are based on mushrooms. And if the whatever we are analyzing has come in contact with those same mushrooms, they're going to become, if they survived, they have that ability to block whatever is going to hit them with the, through their membrane already in them, even if they're 5,000 years old. It didn't evolve. In other words, we're not evolving a new process. And that's what they're saying. And even here, uh, and, and I'm getting to the last slide, An antibiotic resistance is a natural phenomenon that predates modern selective pressure clinical anti use. These are not publishes. I'm not publishing talking things here that are from creationists. Antibiotics are part of the natural ecology of the planet. So when we think that we have developed some drug that won't be susceptible to resistance or some new thing to use in medicine, we are completely kidding ourselves. Microorganisms have figured out a way. Well, they, they don't think, but microorganisms have figured out a way uh, how to get around them well before we ever figured out how to use them. In other words, there's no evolution involved here. They already have it. They've already been pre-programmed. So the observations, there's no new genetic information created by mutations or selection. There's no new biological information that emerged, and there is elimination or reduction of the activity. In conclusion, you're like, Whew, that was a lot of stuff. My favoriteist, that's not a word, is it? Anyway, my favorite verse in the Bible. No, one of the favorites. I have many. But that, this is the one that my association, the creation, Association Création et Science, which means uh, Creation and Science Association in Quebec. Uh, this is our theme, our, our basic, our foundation verse. Colossians 1, 16, 7. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven, things on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things, I love that word, all, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Thank you.